Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let us start. We have enough people, so please mute everyone. Uh, uh, please mute yourself. Somebody is unmuted still. Please mute yourself now, so, because there are some extra noises I see here. So we are continuing our lectures, and uh, well, let me just start sharing my screen and let me start sharing my slide. I believe you see all the slides now. So uh, I recall what we are doing now and i recall that we started chapter five this is an important chapter and your key point now you should be able to see the difference between chapter five and uh, that is the key point so again what does it mean so remember when we talk about chapter four what was your basic equation your basic equation was first of thermodynamics in this form that change of energy is equal to in any kind of process change of energy delta e or delta u it was q minus w so please now this equation is wrong okay it's wrong why it's wrong because we talk about open system control volume system for control volume systems remember there is mass transfer through the bound and at last lecture, we deal with this chapter five for a while, and we derive actually most of equations. Remember, we can see that we can see that any kind of system with inlets and outlets. And what we did, we derived the equation for mass balance, and what is more important later, we the equation for energy balance. So this is how we derive. Right? I don't want you to remember all the relations, but I want you to remember what we did and how we came. So here is our basic equation, right? This is what we got. And remember, so what we have, this basic equation is actually first law for an open system. This is general form for first law, which accounts closed and open system, which accounts for everything. And remember why we came to the formula like this, because the idea about moving flow, the idea about moving flow uh, as compared to flow, it that now instead of mechanical energy, instead of value E, what we call, now we use value theta. Specific value theta, it's what? It's actually U plus V squared over two plus GZ. So it's like internal energy plus kinetic plus potential plus PV term, what we call flow work. Remember, we have this flow work term, work done to deliver here or remove from here the substance. When you have moving flow, we have the stuff. So if you combine together PV plus U, you, you arrive to what? You arrive to enthalpy. So you realize that now enthalpy is very important parameter. Enthalpy will play around the role of internal energy for uh, open systems. So to accurate and to summarize it, so what I want to show. What so if you start solving any problem with chapter five in homework number five, so what you do, you will have the following equation. One equation is more or less simple. It's mass balance. And here how we write it. So what we write here is that what comes into a system is equal to what comes out. M dot I is equal to M E I. M dot E I. So what I recall subscript E means in and you may have actually many, many inlets here. Subscript, subscript I mean inlets. Subscript E mean exit. And you may have potentially many exits of your system, correct? Uh, what is M dot? I recall chapter two. It's mass flow rates. How much mass gets through your system, through your reference frames, through your observer during time instant? It's in kilogram per second. And there are formulas for it. Remember? So M dot. By default, it's row V dot, right? When V dot is uh, volumetric flow rate. And also you can describe like this, where V is the velocity, A is the average cross section, V is smaller specific point. That's one equation and you may realize it. Now, and you may realize as well from here that if M dot is zero, then you have closest. And second or let's say big equation here, it's how it looks like, it's first law. So what are the terms here? Remember, the subscript CV means control volume. It means that we deal with open systems, correct? So 
left hand side says the change of your energy during time per, per unit time is equal to what? Is it equal to heat transfer through your system, through boundary of your system, minus work done inside your system, and also plus and respectively minus these summations? What we have here? These are what we call theta terms. Remember, the theta is a, its counterpart of mechanical energy for moving flow, so that are the terms. And it contains of enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy. Here, specific energy. So this is what you see here, which is a red, is red frame. It's your major equation. So when you will solve any kind of equation in chapter five, you please write down these equations, especially this one. Write down from scratch, write down it, and then think what to do with it, what to solve. We will talk about examples starting from now. And basically you will realize that uh, mo in most of the cases you will be lucky. It means that you don't have all the storms. You don't need to account for all the storms. Sometimes you will have simplifications. But if these storms are presented in the text body, you must account. Does it make sense? Everybody remember this? Okay, so basically again, so what, what you need to realize, what you need to remember. If and read the text body. So what does it mean that you have, for instance, adiabatic system? What would it mean? Adiabatic system would mean that you don't have this storm, right? You will don't you don't have heat trans. Okay. Many times it will be like this. What does it mean that you have uh, you don't have work that done if you have isochoric system? Then there will be no boundary works. Again, you may get rid of this. What does it mean that you have steady system? And believe me, very often you will have steady system. If you have steady systems, then there will be no other storm. Very often you have steady system. Well, sometimes you may realize you will not have potential and kinetic energy. It will be stated you can neglect potential and kinetic energy. What does it mean then? You can get rid of this and you can get rid of this. So your equations will be really very, very simplified and you will be lucky with this. But that's what we have, right? Now, please realize that what happened with this equation if you don't have mass flow rate? So if you don't have mass flow rate, uh, then what? Then there will be no this storm at all. M dot will be zero. And what, what happens if you look now in this equation? What you see here, it's nothing but second law for a closed system, right? So again, this big equation, it's not like different equation. It's general form of first law. It's general form of first law of thermodynamics. It describes both closed and open system. If your system is closed, that's what we had in chapter four and that's how we solved it. But now we do have other terms and these terms most likely dominate over these ones. Do you understand this? So now that is your basic equation. Well, yeah, some people wrote a good, a good comment here. Well, indeed, uh, generally speaking, it's good if you have a question like this for steady system, if you have unsteady system, then instead of this one, you will have like, like this term, right? So this is a general form for equation. This is a general form for equation. But again, I recall that very often you will have steady flow, steady system. So remember what is steady, what is unsteady. We discussed last time, right? So if, if you have steady flow, you don't have right-hand side and you describe it as follows. So that will be your major equations. Here is what we have for steady flow. Then energy term disappears and that only thing you have. Do you understand? Does it make sense for you? That is for steady flow. Now, couple of more things. What you should see from here. If you have steady flow, then what? Then in this equation, there is no uh, internal energy at all. It is, it is enthalpy equation, right? It is enthalpy balance. So for steady system, it is actually enthalpy equation. Only enthalpy is involved in this problem. So what you will be doing from your tables, what you will identify from your tables, it will be enthalpy. You don't need to talk about internal energy. That's why I tell you, enthalpy does not exist in practice, in reality, it's some combination of terms U plus PV, which helps you to solve the problem. 
it's like adjustable gross income. You know, you never see it in your bank account and in the pockets, but the government or agencies use it to calculate what are your benefits, what are your taxes, and so on. The same story here. It helps you to solve the problem, but you deal with enthalpy. And that is different because for closest, the most likely you deal with what? You deal with, the, you, before in last uh, homework, you deal with internal energy. So please make sure you don't confuse. Believe me, it's classical mistakes that you are going to do at exam, uh, second exam in the end of next week. And in the final exam, you are confusing open closed system and everything is messed up in that case. So this is enthalpy balance. So remember this, uh, uh, what else we should remember? Now, when we talk about steady systems, uh, if you talk unsteady systems, about unsteady systems, then what I say here is not the case. So sometimes you may have unsteady system. Then in the left-hand side, you still have this energy term, correct? So your general equation will be like you see in the bottom. And then you have both enthalpy and internal energy together. So that's sometimes will happen. And in your homework, last problem in your homework, it will be about this. By the way, homework number five is not posted yet. I still wait for Dr. Mobain to approve it, but uh, I, I believe it will be posted to, today or about, and it will be due next Wednesday, such that you have, and it will be rigorous deadline because you needed to prepare to your exam, which will be in Friday next week. Help session will be next Monday, next Tuesday uh, as usual. And I do request you to take it seriously and please do this homework, do it yourself. This time I will not give you uh, essay because I want you to focus on preparation to your exam. And please do it timely because the next Wednesday we must post also my, my correct solution. So you have it to prepare for your exam. I record your exam is on Friday, uh, October 30th and it will be based on chapter four and chapter five. So what we are going to do this and what will be in, in, in uh, this homework and uh, what examples we are solving. So you all the time you will start with writing this big equation and then you will analyze what terms to consider, what can be weighed, waived, what cannot be. I recall one more thing. So remember, I talked about this in last class. In what, and this is particularly important for uh, steady system. When you talk about closed system, remember what we did. It was like we went from state one to state two, right? So basically what you had, you had something like this. You, it was state one like this. It was state two like this, something like this, right? You have expansion or compression and you investigated. This is state one, you took it from tables. Then it was state two, you took it from tables and then you wrote down equation. Now, for open system, please realize what happened. Now your state one is inlet, okay? It's I condition. Your state two is outlet, it's E condition. And they actually coexist, right? So if you consider any kind of bird or insect or fish which comes in and out, so what happens? That is your state one when you come in and then in, inside your black box, inside your control volume system, you are compressed, uh, expanded, uh, boiled, uh, crushed, uh, friction, whatever it happens. And after this, you come to the outlet if you're still alive. And basically this will be your state two with different pressure, different temperature and so on and so on. So again, remember what you should do. State one, go to a tables, identify all parameters. You need two parameters. If you know pressure and temperature, for instance, you'll find everything else. Identify state one, it's in inlet. Identify state two. Again, it's separate task. State two differs from state one. It may be fully or fully different. State one may be liquid, state two will be vapor. Go to tables, identify state two. And then employ this big equation that we wrote down right away. And that's what you expected. Does it make sense for you? Please ask me something. So that's what we discussed. And then next, what we are doing, we employ this to consideration of real systems. So basically this is classical device that we may have in practice. Most systems like turbines, compressors are really steady. And, but they all have other terms like heat losses and so on. So that what you will, we will use, what will be incorporated and implemented. We start now, it's important to start with simplest devices. Devices named nozzles and diffusers. So what are nozzles and diffusers? 
fantasy, all, all of them are called nozzles. So these are pipes. This is something like a pipe, pipe with variable cross section. So generally, nozzle is what? No, nozzle is a pipe like this when uh, cross section decreases. So in fact, what happens that when you decrease nozzle, your velocity increases and your pressure goes down. It's something like a traffic jam. Imagine you drive and from three lanes, you come to two lanes. What have uh, or vice versa. So that is the flow and that is diffuser how it happens. Basically diffuser it's vice versa. When you go from small cross section to larger cross section. So basically uh, velocity is here decreases, but pressure increases. And even if you look here with, without any consideration like this, you may realize what happened. In terms of energy conservation of enthalpy conservation, what happened inside the nozzle or diffuser? Do you agree that you, we, there is like conversion exchange between pressure and velocity, right? In the nozzle, you, can, you convert part of your pressure into velocity. Your pressure decreases, but you accelerate. In diffuser, it's vice versa. You decelerate and increase pressure. Do you understand this? And what is pressure? Remember, pressure is one of the term is enthalpy. It's U plus PV. So in fact, you have conversion between enthalpy and kinetic energy. That is the idea about nozzles and diffusers. Right? Here it is. So that is nozzle, that is diffuser. And very, and very often, uh, you will have that uh, in nozzle, uh, your velocity at the exit is much, much larger than velocity in the inlet. So you may neglect initial velocity, while in diffuser it's vice versa. Also, and now the question is, so what equation can I imply and how to use? So I recall we have this big equation and you will see below in this picture that most likely for nozzle, what is the idea about nozzle? I told you convert pressure into velocity. So convert enthalpy into velocity. So generally speaking, from your nozzle, you want it to be ideal. So you don't want to have heat losses. You, want, you don't want to have any expansion or compression. You will neglect kinetic and potential energy. So in that sense, what will happen? In that sense, your big equation that we described so far will be just this. It will be converted into this. It will be just only these terms will remain from here. And then you really can find what, what you have. Does it make sense for you? To be more specific, okay, advice like this. So basically, let's talk right down our our general equation, uh, how it look like. Here is your equation, right? If you have steady flow, you don't have left hand side, so this is your equation. If your diffuser like this, so what we want? You don't want any kind of work to be done there, right? You don't want you, you if your diffuser is horizontal, you don't want this one, right? Because Z1 is equal to Z2 if it's horizontal. So basically, and you don't, do you want any heat losses? You don't want heat losses. So in ideal diffuser, you will have only the following. So this is relation that we describe. The change of enthalpy will be change of kinetic, change of specific enthalpy will be change of kinetic energy. Do you understand this? Does it make sense for you? I hope so. Please ask me something. Now, there are good points to ask here. So the question is the following, one question. Can I really neglect these three terms? Answer is the following. Well, there is no final answer. Read your text body. If in the text body something stated there are heat losses in the amount of, or it stated that nozzle is inclined with the uh, inclination length of five meters, then you must account for it. Whatever in the text, you should account, okay? But if it's not stated, then you generally can neg neglect all the stocks. Why? Because they are not primary for nozzle. The idea about nozzle is convert H into V squared, okay? Or vice versa. That's why you cannot neglect these terms. They should be there. So that's what you have. Now, another point I want you, so it's like this, or, I can consider it here, so I will put it here and you will realize. And another point that you really want to know and we need to know, these are your terms, right? So basically you will have that H1 is equal to H2. So generally speaking, if it's like this mass will go out and you come to the stock. What I want you to remember, what you must remember when you look at this equation, this is something important. 
I recall. Where are you going to get these enthalpies? You are going to get these enthalpies from your tables, correct? So if you, or, or whatever, from tables, from equations, whatever it is. In your tables, what are the units for enthalpy? I, I showed last time, I recall, because it's classical mistakes that people do. It's kilojoule per kilogram, correct? Kilojoule per kilogram, which is what? Which is thousand, thousand, thousand joule per kilogram, correct? Now, kinetic energy that you use here, what are units of kinetic energy? Meter squared over second squared, right? Which will come to joule per kilogram. So please understand that values that you consider here should be self-consistent. The value of enthalpy is typically a thousand times three order of magnitudes larger than this one. So please, 15% of you will do this mistakes next week at exam two. I, I beg this. So please take it seriously. Write down dimensions and make conversion. If I have three boxes of uh, three tons of cherries and, and five more cherries, it's not I have eight cherries. I have three tons plus five. Your to, dimensions should be self-consistent. And to, to be very accurate, always write down dimension, write down it. If you write down, you will be confused. But if you write down numbers and say, okay, in the end I will add my dimension, or I will forget to add it at all, then you will confuse. Please remember, that. that's important. Do you understand this? Does it make sense for you? This is meet, uh, joule per kilogram. And all this, so, and the same for all other items we have here. This is joule per kilogram, joule per kilogram. This will be kilojoule per kilogram. You should multiply it by thousand to get it because this value is quite big, okay? You may realize it. Now, okay. Let us do some example. You will have this example in your homework and there is very nice example actually in your textbook about this. Let me go here. So here is example. Uh, again, I just open it like it is. So please read uh, the separation of air in a diffuse. So that's what you have. Uh, read, it's example 5.4 in your textbook. Please read it. So you have diffuser. Right, so it, what is diffuser? Diffuser is device like this. So you have some kind of oil like this, right? So you have some kind of expansion. So that's what you have. You have a diffuser. So basically how it look like? It's like this, right? Something like this. And this is inlet. And this is outlet, right? Yeah, I know in reality it's something very sophisticated, but it's simple device like this. So read the text. Air, it stated that air at 10 degrees Celsius and 80 kilopascals enter the diffuser of jet engine with a velocity of 200 meters per second, okay? It stated that you, you know the inlet area of the diffuser is given, right? This area is 0.4 meters squared, you have it, correct? And what do you have? At the very beginning, you have all the parameters. You have T1, right? You have P1, what else you have? You have inlet velocity, which is V1 also. So where is V1? So you have V1 here. And basically P, T are known, right? So this is your temperature. This is your pressure. Okay, from here, do I know everything about state one? If I know pressure and temperature, is it enough to identify anything else I need? Yes. And what I need here, what I'm interested in? What value I'm looking for? Well, you say that I didn't let you to read the text. Well, you do, <laughs> that's true. But what we are looking in this chapter five, what is our major parameter in chapter five? Excellent. It's enthalpy. We need enthalpy, exactly. Well, M, well, M dot, uh, yes, but not only M dot. M dot, it's like, uh, so basically that's a point. Uh, you need to determine the mass flow rate and the temperature of the air leaving the diffuse. So we, uh, okay, so these two parameters, temperature and M dot. So what I should use? So this is my state one 
And this will be my state two, which I don't know, right? I don't know state two. It will be P2, T2, H2, and so on, correct? So, and in the exit, I will have another so area like this. So I know A1, here is will be A1, right? But I, I don't know A2 and us. So what equations I, I will implement? What do I need to know? What equations? Well, okay. Uh, I tell you all equations. You know all equations here they are, right? Okay. Here is one equation. And here is my second equation, correct? So my second equation will be very simple, how it will look like. My second equation, there will be no mass flow rate, so it will be just m dot. And what equation should I implement for m dot? Well, for m dot, I will implement nothing but this one, right? Do I know surface area? All like this, okay? So do I know initial velocity? Do I know initial value? Do I know initial cross section? Will I be able to, uh, to find the initial specific volume? How? Well, it's ideal gas from ideal gas law. I know P and T, right? So will I be able to find them dot? Yes. Okay. Now, but that's nice. That's a mass flow rate balance. But your key equation is energy equation. So in our energy equation, what do we have here and what we can forget about? in our equation. So this is your major equation. What do we have in, in, in among these terms? Do we, is a steady diffuser? Yes, it's steady diffuser. Do we have heat loss? No. Do we have any kind of work? No. Do we have, is it horizontal diffuser? Yes. Do we have many inlets or outlets? No, so we'll have one inlet, one outlet, right? So what is remain, what remains this one? And this. So that's only we have. Now, this is my inlet condition. This is outlet condition. So from where I can get inlet condition? From my table, do I know P1, T1 here? From here, will I be able to find enthalpy? Yes. So from where, will I be able to find outlet condition? So. If I know outlet condition, will I be able to find dental P here? Will I be able to get T2 from here? Do you understand this? Please ask me something. Okay. Can you walk through how we would get T2? From there. I will, I will, we, we will come to this. Any question, but, but before this, any question about uh, what equations to employ? So, do you agree that our energy equation, look at this picture here on the screen. Do you agree that our basic equation will, will be nothing but the following, right? So that will be your equation, correct? And I can cut M from here and M from here, I will have this one is equal to this one, correct? Do you agree if I can write it from here as the following? Do you agree with this equation? Yes or not? Again, here is my diffuser. Here is my state one. Here is my state two. What is my H1? Can I get H1 from here? How I can get it? I will go to my tables. I will go to my tables and identify it. Then if I know H2, I will go back to table and identify T2. Let me show it. What table we are talking about here? You talk about air. What is the table for air? What is the table for air? The table A17, correct? So let's go to our tables. Let's see if I have open table here. I think I have. Yes, I have. Let's go to table A17. 
and I and see what what we consider. To. So it's table A seventeen. It's table for air, right? So what is my temperature at the very beginning? What is my temperature? Temperature in the inlet is what? Temperature in the inlet is uh, ten degrees Celsius. Okay. Ten degrees Celsius. So at ten degrees Celsius, uh, well, you can approximate a ten degrees Celsius. Which is in, the, in terms of Kelvin, it will be 283. So I'm somewhere in between here. So to calculate my value, I know that my enthalpy will be something here in between 280 and 285. Correct. Now I gave you very, I gave you before quite good hint, right? So well, generally speaking, you need to do interpolation, but there is well, well interpolate strictly speaking, yes. But now we will save time because remember that very good idea about air. Because Cp for air is 105, remember if you have temperature in Kelvin here, it's very close to enthalpy in kilojoule per kilogram, right? Do you understand? Basically, you can approximate it. So what we, we can do here based on this, we can actually, so we can take if our temperature is 283 Kelvin, we can more or less nicely uh, approximate it as follows. Well, this is a rigorous result, but I will not mind if you just write 283 kilojoule per kilogram, right? Because how we come to it? Because it's uh, temperature in Kelvin is 283 Kelvin and 15 units, right? So that is your H1. Does it make sense? So we identified state one, okay? Now, if I look here, can I, can I find H2? Do I know H1 from here? Yes, I know H1, right? I know it here. Do I know my all velocities? Yes, what is my V1? In fact, it stated that you, you can neglect uh, uh, V1 is compared to V2. So V2 I can neglect and V1 is given. It's 200 meters per second, right? So I will make a calculation. Now, look here, very important point. What happened here? What happened here? Why we divide by thousand? Why do we divide by thousand here? Because of dimensions. Remember, H is kilojoule per kilogram. Velocity is 200 meters squared meter per second. So when I calculate it in squared, I will come to what? What will be 200 meters per second in squared? It will be 40,000. It's a very big number. 40,000, 40,000, right? 40,000. It looks like it's a very big number. 40,000. 40,000. But this 40,000 of what? It will be of joule per kilogram, right? It will be nice, and, but just only 40 kilojoule per kilogram. That's why we divide it here. And if you calculate, so your H2, it's only 303. Do you understand about these three orders of magnitude? I believe so. So please now see what's happening. Your velocity is quite big. Very good question. Can we make assumption that the exit of a diffuser is zero every time unless stated otherwise? Yes, exactly. That's some kind of incorrectness. If you don't have data, you make this assumption. If you have data for exit velocity, you must count for it. I know it's not something, not very accurate answer, but you solve engineering problem. You should use whatever is available, okay? If you don't have, if you have this velocity in the text, please count for it. If you don't have, you neglect it. But now I want to show something else. Let me see like this. This is my H2 and this is my uh, H1, right? This is my H1 and H2 appears 303, right? So please realize your enthalpy change only by 20 kilojoule per kilogram. In fact, it changed by about 7%, right? And velocity, which what I have, V1 is very big. It's 200 meters per second. It's no, it's very windy. You know what is 200 meters per second? It's almost, uh, it's not sound speed. It's half of sound speed. 
but it's very fast. It's extremely fast. Plane flies with this velocity. And what happened? That when I convert this big velocity, this big kinetic energy into enthalpy, enthalpy changed only by 7%. And this is my H2, it's 303. What does it mean? It means that enthalpy, it's a huge storage of energy. It's a big storage of thermal energy that we have here. Please realize, it's huge storage of energy. That's why we, instead of slaves, elephants, camels, horses, hands, we now use steam machine and energy in manufacturing. Steam, you don't see it, but it's very strong. I told you, uh, if you want to see how steam is strong, please uh, start cooking something. Put on appliance uh, vessel with hot water, put some heavy roof on it and forget about it. And believe me, in a couple of hours, your roof will fly and crush your roof at the apartment and your neighbors will see what's going on. Steam is very strong. Do you see it here? I converted 200 meters per second of kinetic energy, of velocity in terms of kinetic energy into enthalpy, and I got only 20 kilojoule per kilogram. Imagine this. Now, do you understand how big mistake you would do if you take instead of 40, 40,000 here, if you forget to divide by three orders of magnitude? I believe so. That's very important. Believe me, 15, 20% of you, hopefully those who don't attend my lectures, will do this mistake next week at the exam. Take it serious. So do you understand how to solve this now? What I do next? I go back to my tables and see, okay, here I will have 303. What temperature corresponds to this? And if you go to a table, you will clearly realize, uh, then what? You will clearly realize that it will be, well, you can calculate here, but in fact, you don't need to calculate. Uh, you will get that. You will get that uh, enthalpy is uh, 303. It will be again something in between here, but it will be about 303 Kelvin. So you will, and you can get this item. So that it is. Do you understand how to solve it? Do you understand this? Now, it was another question in this whole problem. Please calculate mass flow rate. So how to calculate mass flow rate? Well, again, it's ideal gas. You employ ideal gas law. So it's at initial state, you calculate what is the initial specific volume. You take this formula, you take what is R from your table, you take R value, you take temperature. Remember, here temperature should be in Kelvin, not 10 degrees Celsius. For ideal gas law, temperature should be in Kelvin. You already remember, but it's a second classical mistake that you may do. Calculate so you find specific volume. What you do next? You have this formula for M dot for mass flow rate. Substitute what you calculated and you will find mass flow rate in kilogram per second, whatever it is. Well, in this particular problem, you don't need M dot to calculate temperature, but sometimes you may need it. Key point, make sure you know what equations to employ, what equations to use. Does it make sense? Please ask me something. Do you know how to deal with diffusers and nozzles now? I believe so. Please realize, please realize that this is just example and there are other devices in your home. So do consider this example it's uh, 5.4 that we consider right now. And basically now we come to more sophisticated devices such that uh, turbines, compressors, and so on. So now you may realize what is our strategy until the end of this week and next week. We will consider different devices, nozzles, uh, diffusers, turbines, compressors, throttling valves, and others, and see how they work out uh, what are, how our equation look like for them. So right now I am going to talk about turbines and compressors. I have about 10 minutes, just enough to, to talk about this. So please take a look. We are here. So basically what we're talking about. Now totally, let's talk more questions. Okay, uh, 
basically that's classical example that's classical examples we typically use because when we have compressors turbines pumps uh, fans what, whatever so basically nozzles and diffusers just, just convert enthalpy into kinetic energy but most likely what we use in manufacturing in power source we, we, we have power plants so when we want to convert heat into work and work into heat. classical example is here on this on the screen you see compressor and in, in fact uh, there is a example in your uh, textbook about this what we have here we have compressor it's a device uh, so what is compressor it's a device in which air is uh, uh, air or liquid or anything is compressed. So basically we distinguish compressor and uh, fan and pumps as following. So compressor typically deal with gases, okay? Because you know, gas are rarefied, they occupy the entire volume. So really we have higher compression, volume is changed, specific volume is changed, the SNT is changed. Pumps typically deal with liquids instead of gases. So there is no density change much. And fans, they just have minor slightly pressurized gas, so there is no much change. Our classical device here is a compressor. So basically what happens here? Let's see what, how, this is how a typical compressor look like. So imagine you have air compressor. At the very beginning, you have temperature, or given temperature and pressure. Air with some given mass flow rates come in. And uh, then at the outlet, you will have different temperature, different pressure. Well, in this particular device, you have heat losses for given for unit of mass. So if you multiply M dot by Q, you will have heat losses. And the question is to find work uh, work input here because you know compressor needs some external work to, to, to be included here, work input. So from the point of view of your compressor, this work will be negative. For turbine work is positive, here it's negative. If you write it to work in, it will be absolute value. So your basic equation will be like this if you look at here, right? You may consider it. And basically that's what you have if you neglect kinetic and potential energy. So that's how your basic equation look like. And basically example here, it's example, again, what you see here, it's example from your textbook. I recommend you to consider it. Here it is, I, uh, no, this is uh, for diffuser. Uh, yes, this is the example we consider. So example 5.6 is from your textbook. I do recommend to consider it and uh, really uh, convenient example. But I do want to do something else now. I want to talk about turbines and make a comp comparison. So what is a turbine? Turbine is like opposite to compressor. Turbine is device like this. Please take a look here. Turbine is something there is flow here, right? There is this flow. And basically there are blades like they're shown like this. So when flow comes in, it rotates the blade and it produces some kind of work. And this work can be used well. If you it's electrical power power plant, your turbine rotate generator. Well, uh, to very simplicity, I remember when I was very small small kid, my my uncle uh, has been like a power plant engineer, and he explained me very simple how a power plant looks like. There is a turbine. Turbine rotates generator. Generator give you electricity. Okay, that it is. So steam rotates turbine. Turbines rotate the generator. So we need some work out. So how it works? Basically, you want your turbine to be steady, right? Otherwise it will be overheated. So left turn in our equation should be zero. And let's see what will happen if it's steady. So this is our turbine modeling. Here is our equation. Now, again, unless specified, you should account for all these terms. If they are given in your text, you should account for them. If they are not given, you may neglect them. But again, what do you want from your turbine? You wanted to produce work. Which term? It's this, WCV dot. That is the term you want to have. So do you want your turbine to re release heat? No. Do you want your turbine to produce some kinetic energy to release output flow? Basically not. You want to neglect this term. And generally this term is very small. What about this term? Do you want, in fact, your turbine typically horizontal, so you neglect it. And you really want to avoid heat losses. So generally speaking, if you come to your turbine, this will be your equation. Your equation will look like this, okay? So this is your equation for your turbine. Again, this is simplification. In general uh, form, you should account for all the storms. But please realize this equation. And I will tell you that there is good example in your uh, textbook. Maybe you can, see, you can see it next time about turbine power generated by steam. It's example 5.7. 
when you will realize that if you account for all the storms, the API really, really small. If you account for all the storms, it will be this value. If you don't account, still it, it, it will come to quite uh, big results. So basically, this is answer when we account for all terms. This is answer without them. You will see you may neglect in general. Them. So that is your turbine. And now you will let me ask you like this. If I look here, this is your turbine, okay? So this value, is it positive or negative? Do you agree? In fact, what, what I write here, it will be like this. It will be H1 dot minus H2 dot, correct? H2 dot. And is it positive or negative? Tell me, please. It's positive because work is done by the system, right? Turbine generates work, so it's positive. In fact, what happened here? If I consider, uh, let's say I consider power plant, which produce electricity. So, so what is this? It's like I have uh, some high level of enthalpy, right? So I have level of enthalpy like this. I can plot it like H dot. And then I release enthalpy and then I will have H2 dot, right? And their difference, their difference, it's my work output, right? Work output, which should, which should be positive, right? Because work is done by the system. So otherwise, what turbine does? You you spent enthalpy, you spent, you had H1, right? You went to some store and bought work, right? So you spent piece of H1, H2, what is what is change in your pocket? You pay it for work, right? You pay enthalpy for work, you buy work. You didn't have this work, but you want to have it. You pay, in, enthalpy is your currency in which you pay for it, right? So you spend enthalpy from your pocket and back you get work generated by turbine, which is positive with electricity. Do you understand this? Why I say this? Why it's so important to remember that this is positive? I will tell you why. Before the, I will end soon, but I will to show this. For compressor and pumps, I told you, we'll talk about compressor, which is substance, which is compressed gas, at like a pump. So what is compressor? It's like anti-turbine. In compressor, you produce some work on a compressor. So how your equation will look like? Again, you want your co compressor, it's actually part of your refrigerator, typically in a cycle. So in compressor, again, you don't, do you want your compressor to overheat or not? In your compressor, what? In your compressor, you don't have a uh, left-hand side, right? So this is your equation. Again, do you want kinetic energy in your compressor? Do you want uh, potential energy in your compressor? No, you want to get rid of it. Do you want your compressor to lose heat? No. So basically, again, approximately you will come to this equation. I recall that is if you don't have, if, if you're eligible to neglect this term. In example, I talk about example 5.6, there is heat losses that you should count. But look here, do you see this formula? And look back here, what is this? This is formula for a turbine and this is formula for a compressor. Is there any difference between them? Are they identical? Or there is some conceptual difference here? Tell me please for bonus ticket. Okay, now there will be many answers. Great. Exactly. On the system. Exactly, exactly. So basically if I write it like this, again, I can write like H1 minus H2. But what happens here? This will be negative, why it's negative? It will be my, because now this work is done on your system. It's, it's done on your system, it's done on the compressor. It's like minus work input, right? So it's negative. If I look the same picture here, this is my H1 here. And this is my H2, right? And here it is me who deposited something inside, right? Correct? So this work was negative. So H2 is larger because uh, H2 is larger than H1. I deposit some, some input here, right? Do you understand this? 
That make different. In turbine, you spend in turbine, you are rich guy with good enthalpy. Enthalpy was in your pocket. You spent a, a piece of enthalpy to buy work, right? Compressor is vice versa. You do work here to earn enthalpy. And H2 appears larger than H1. You earn the enthalpy by doing this work on your compressor. Do you understand this? So even the formula is the same, sign will be opposite. And that's very important to when you solve the problems to, to check. For turbine, it should be work output. For turbine, I can write that V turbine will be equal to work output. For compressor, work will be minus work input. Do you understand this? If you talk about absolute values, if you talk about absolute values, do you understand this? That's important. Next, I will stop at this point, but I do recommend you to go through example 5.6 uh, and 7. And also in the homework, you will be having example like this. And next time we will consider some of these examples. But this conceptual difference between turbines and compressors. Do you understand this? Formula is the same. Approximate formula is the same, but sign is opposite. Turbine spans enthalpy and converts it into work output. Compressor eats your work input to increase enthalpy because what is compressor? It's higher pressure. So you, you promote enthalpy, H2 is larger than H1. So pressure is higher. You understand this? Okay, when you did it, excellent. Then we'll have only throttling devices and uh, heat exchangers and mixers and almost that's all. I think we're in a good shape. If everything goes well, maybe next Monday, next week, we may have a short quiz if, that, if you have enough time. Otherwise, uh, we will not have it, but uh, I think we're in good shape now. So please uh, uh, ask you, I will stop at this point, stop sharing, but please ask your questions. Any questions? Let me then, then let me stop recording and good luck until then see you all on Wednesday and please take it seriously your exam is just in two weeks from now.